I welcome everyone to this session on the societal readiness level, which is still their thinking tool, uh, which was de the developed in the, in the four years of the New Horizon project. Um, I will first uh, uh, introduce you to our team because we have been working on this over the time with a lot of people and I would like to uh, introduce to you to you to them first um, and starting with uh, Niels, work package leader in, uh, in, uh, in work package six and uh, uh, co-host of this session with me. Please, Niels, please introduce yourself shortly your uh, institute and background a bit. Thank you very much, uh, Ingeborg. Yes, I, I'm Nils Malgaard, uh, professor at the political science department at uh, Aarhus University. And as uh, Ingeborg uh, said, I have been uh, co-leading this uh, work package on developing the societal readiness thinking tool with uh, Ingeborg. And then moving to Matthias uh, straight away. Good morning, Matthias. Good morning. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm Matthias Nielsen. I'm an associate professor at the sociology department at the University of Copenhagen. And I was earlier collaborating closely with Nils on the development of this tool at Aarhus University, where I was an assistant professor prior to this job. Yeah. Thanks. Moving to Michael. Michael Bernstein, welcome. Thank you. Um, yep, my name is Michael Bernstein. I'm a researcher at the Austrian Institute of Technology based in Vienna. Um, and I was collaborating extensively with uh, the Aarhus team um, with great pleasure on this uh, piece of the project when I was based at uh, Genok in, in Norway. Thanks. And moving to Tung Tung Chan. Hi, my name is Tung Tung, and I'm, uh, I was a researcher at uh, Leiden University Center of Science and Technology Studies when we're in this project. Uh, currently, I'm a policy advisor at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Thanks. Uh, moving to Andre. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, I'm from Brazil originally, uh, where I work as an evaluation officer for the Brazilian Agency for support and evaluation of graduate education. Uh, and since 2019, I've been working on a PhD at the Center for Science and Technology Studies in Leiden. So I had the opportunity to join the New Horizon team uh, midway through the development of the thinking tool. Thanks, Andre. And now moving to Stefan. Hi, my name is Stefan de Jong. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Organization Studies at Tilburg University and a Marie Curie Fellow at the Department of Sociology uh, at the University of uh, Chicago. Um, prior to uh, these affiliations, I was affiliated to uh, Leiden University, the CWTS, to work on the validation of the thinking tool. Thanks, Stefan. And my name is Ingmar Meyer. I also work at the Center for Science and Technology Studies in Leiden as a senior researcher. I was involved in New Horizon and also in some other RRI projects, uh, both the territorial and the monitoring and evaluation ones, so heavily uh, included in the um, RRI bubble. Um, and um, we are setting up this uh, session, uh, we have set up the session to, to have uh, to discuss uh, the development of the thinking tool from the start uh, and we do that in a kind of conversational way so one by one we will discuss will be kind of a, not an interview but a conversation on how the different steps were taken and why and how we arrived at uh, at, uh, at the point where we are now um, and I think next slide um, Niels, I think the major shift that we made in our thinking and that we made it very early on was already was when we moved from an SRL, which was originally asked for in the call uh, to complement with the TRL, the technology readiness level, to a thinking tool and leaving out the level. So maybe you could elaborate a bit on, on uh, how we turned this into a thinking tool, a societal readiness thinking tool, and not an RRI thinking tool. Thanks, I can try, uh, Ingeborg. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's true 
uh, that already in the, the call for proposals uh, that uh, the New Horizon Consortium uh, reacted uh, to, there was an expectation uh, that the project would be working towards uh, the notion of um, societal readiness level. And I think that the idea was to uh, create an equivalent or at least something resembling the notion of technology readiness uh, levels uh, as developed by NASA in the, in the 80s and the 90s and uh, heavily employed in relation to uh, technological progress and innovation uh, uh, processes, both by the European Commission, but, but also by uh, uh, many other central actors in the research and innovation system. And the idea of the technology readiness uh, level approach is that technologies from their conceptions until their completion enter through different phases of maturity in something that could be described in terms of a taxonomy of uh, steps of uh, ever increasing uh, functional sophistication. So uh, the idea is that technologies start with an idea and end up being marketable, and they go through phases of uh, uh, development that are fairly uh, linear in a sense. Uh, the focus of the technology readiness level is very much about making technologies work. So it's kind of a technical assessment of technological um, um, and research uh, development. It doesn't really capture the extent to which uh, there's going to be a, an alignment between uh, the uh, what the technology offers and what is actually required, expected uh, from the societal point of view. There, ha there have been a number of uh, uh, attempts to reorganize the thinking around the technology, in this, uh, technology readiness level approach, much more in terms of societal demand or market uh, readiness. Uh, and these kind of um, um, novel attempts to create tax taxonomies uh, ask uh, more about uh, the degree of marketability. Will there be a, a demand? Will there be a, a need on the side of uh, uh, users and consumers with regard to the technologies? But still, these attempts did not ex exactly uh, capture what we were hoping to do in the context of the project of responsible research and innovation for a number of reasons. The first reason uh, is that none of these uh, prior taxonomies actually uh, allowed for the reflection about the alignment between long-term societal uh, impacts and needs and technological developments nor did they, um, to the degree that we thought was necessary, take into account that um, innovation processes and technological development in many ways is not uh, linear. It can sometimes be circular. It can sometimes be significantly more complex or complicated. And what we were looking for was uh, um, uh, was not so much an idea of uh, maturity, of linear maturity uh, uh, developments, but more of an approach to thinking critically uh, about uh, societal alignment and readiness at different stages of um, a research project or a, a, a technology development uh, uh, process. So we decided at an early point that we would be uh, pay more attention to ensuring uh, access to reflection, uh, critical scrutiny, uh, discussion, uh, inclusion of stakeholders at critical phases of uh, a research project or, 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 um, or an innovation project. Um, so we departed from uh, the idea of uh, taxonomy and uh, linear progression and ended up with the uh, notion of uh, a thinking tool. We think it aligns more with uh, um, 
the philosophy behind uh, the overall uh, New Horizon uh, uh, project. Now, my colleagues will say a lot more about what, what the thinking tool is actually uh, about, so I should probably uh, leave it at that. Thanks, Niels. I think that is uh, a very, very good to setting the stage of, of how of where we started uh, back then. And I think Matthias, Matthias is moving to this next slide, please. Um, um, I think that uh, in the early stage, and by the way, if you have any questions, please, uh, uh, you can put them in the chat and they will be handled. And after every conversation, I will check with Marie whether there are any questions. So don't hesitate to write them down. So this was, this was all taking place in the very early stages of project development. And, and Matthias has been there from the beginning and, and he will address two, two important issues that we that we expanded on in the beginning and that was the the, the literature uh, process that resulted in two uh, actually two important decisions one to introduce gates and the other one to introduce the questions which are more, much more aligned as Niels explained with the with thinking than with a level so Matthias can you please elaborate on both decision also from the from the literature and theoretical perspective well, yeah, um, so, so sort of the starting point here was to get a grasp of everything in the literature on these points and on the questions of societal readiness and, and broader discussions of responsibility. And since we wanted this to be sort of a, a practical tool that could encourage um, reflexivity at, at, at different stages in a project, we had to make these sort of, you can say, a little bit crude decisions about various steps in a project. So I think everyone in the team acknowledges that uh, pr uh, research project, innovation projects can differ a lot in sort of their different steps, their designs and so on, but we had to sort of develop a shared framework, a sort of template that, that allows researchers that are engaged in different sorts of activities and projects to think about uh, questions of societal readiness and how they can improve the societal readiness of what they're doing. So based on these reflections, we sort of structured the uh, tool to cover four discrete phases that we think are common to, to most research projects. And in the first, as you can see here in the figure, the first of these phases cover what we can call the ide ideation process, where new ideas for discovery are, are kind of conceptualized, where research problems uh, become formulated, and where we sort of develop procedures for data collection, or at least plan them. And then we have a phase that actually covers the implementation, the phase where data collection takes place, where an experiment may be implemented. We have a third phase that focuses on the analysis of the results, uh, the evaluation of an experiment, um, and also interpretation of what do we find in these data. And finally, there is a fourth phase which concerns more specifically uh, dissemination. How do we disseminate results? How do we um, communicate our project and our findings to a broader audience of stakeholders, researchers, and the public in, in general. Um, and while we separate, like I just said, we separate uh, the, the, we separate these four phases um, and we also represent them chronologically in the tool, although with arrows pointing in different, different directions, they're of course not always consecutive. And that's important to remember that in real project scientists may move back and forth between the phases and people that are using the tool can also move back and forth. It's not like there's one specific way of approaching this. If you wish to return to the ideation phase after collecting data to redevelop, to do an iteration, that's entirely possible here. These should, these should more be, be seen as different phases that are not necessarily chronologically ordered in all projects, but we have tried to develop sort of reflection tools for each phase, and, and that's been the, the core purpose here. Then you can see the four gates here, and they represent the time in the project where people move from one phase to a next. So if you look at the first one, it could be the move from research design and problem formulation to the implementation and data collection. And generally, the tool is built on the idea that the best um, the best opportunities for integrating perspective on, uh, perspectives on societal readiness and responsibility, they will occur in the early phases of the project. So although there are important considerations all the way through in this process, it's critical to acknowledge 
ask people engaging in these sorts of activities that it's very difficult to retrofit existing projects. So they sort of, sort of at the end stage start to think about societal readiness. This is much easier to do from the start. And therefore we have also put emphasis on sort of developing a larger group of questions uh, for the beginning stages of the project. So that's also part of the logic that there is a, a strong emphasis on the importance of sort of taking these considerations into account in the early phase. And then I think we can perhaps move on to, to the questions. Next slide, please. So in the tool, at each gate, we have developed a set of questions that are relevant to researchers and innovators. Um, and the questions you can see say are generic, they're reflective, and they should, as the core purpose, they should help participants identify and also account for societal dimensions in their projects. And the questions are structured according to the six keys uh, that the European uh, Commission uh, represents in terms of responsible research and innovation, and also still going over with ideas of dimensions of anticipation, reflection, inclusion, and respons uh, responsiveness. And um, I won't go into, I don't have time to go into detail about these concepts specifically. What I want to say here is that we've tried to develop questions for each gate, each of the gates you saw in the prior figure. Um, where we have gone through the existing literature, looked at what source of important reflections do innovators, do um, researchers need to do in order to improve the societal relevance of their work. Um, and then we try to adapt all of these important reflections to, so they suit as, as questions that may be useful um, in the tool. And we've of course also developed additional questions as part of the exercise. And as one of my colleagues will um, return to later, that's actually in the tool also an option for researchers to add additional questions, both in terms of their own ways of reflecting upon this, but it also allows us to sort of reiterate the relevant questions by seeing how are people actually using this, what sort of questions are important at each stage in the process. Um, so in that sense, um, this should perhaps be seen a little bit as a dynamic set of questions that will of course also alter and, and change as um, the um, we see developments in different types of research, new questions occur, um, but they should sort of serve as a, as a starting point that would allow um, participants in the project to discuss and reflect upon how they can improve the uh, societal relevance of their own work. Yeah, so, so I guess that's my brief introduction to, to this early work in the project. Yeah, and it has been quite, quite a lot of work. It, it looks as if uh, all these uh, 24 cells with the question looks as, uh, as if they were simply filled, but this is also uh, thanks to the work of, 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 of all the team members in this. And actually, it was also discussed during the... No, uh, one more ahead, please. One more. It was also discussed during one of the consortium meetings and then of course the question arose well how are you going to use these 24 times 4 is 72 cells with questions because that is totally not user friendly uh, and then the whole development process started tung tung so please um yeah so in deliverable 6.1 we see that uh niels and matthias have have develop this sophisticated table but we also thought that you know everybody would fall asleep when they look at the table so it's time to uh, make something fun and beautiful out of it so um, you know looking into uh, many kinds of design principles and ways of thinking about how to uh, make this table into something much more accessible uh, I came across design sprint so design sprint is a methodology uh, developed by Google uh, because uh, in this business, the business world, they don't have time uh, to to make decisions and be in discussion boardrooms all the time. So uh, they decided to develop this method to solve problems and create uh, solutions uh, in five days. Uh, but our team don't even have five days and I um, sort of reduce it to two days where in day one, we understand the problem and uh, we map the issues and then we uh, sketch 
uh, then we immediately decide what are the features that we like from each other's sketches. Um, and then from day two, we actually uh, do a storyboarding and prototype. So here we see a posters of Ocean's Eleven because um, doing this design sprint is like a heist. So everybody have their own role. Uh, my role is of course a facilitator and everyone has a different role um, and they were assigned. So for example, Niels and Ingeborg were the decider. If the group couldn't decide on um, anything or have um, differences in our thinking, uh, then Niels and Ingeborg would make the final call, of course. Um, and the, the rest are sprinters and we, we do our thing. Um, and that leads to um, something called uh, a wireframe. So we developed a prototype um, and we actually bring home uh, the design to a graphic designer. So because we all have sketches, so we need someone professional uh, to make it into a reality. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ning Tung. And then of course, we had the design and we had the questions and then they had to be glued together one way or the other. So, so Michael, may, and, and the next slide, please. I think what, what, is, what is, we needed something in between. So why would people enter a tool looking for questions uh, if we have a tool and how, how then develop these entry points that we introduced? So maybe you can elaborate a bit on that uh, and also uh, explain how this process of coupling the questions to the entry points took place because it seemed, it looks like a simple scheme, but of course that it, it, it's not. So Michael, please, uh, since you have been involved in this part of the, of the work a lot, and also during the design, um, maybe you can explain that. Sure. Um, so one of the things that was really exciting to me about seeing the <clears throat> sort of the solid found, and broad foundation of the, the question grids that um, Niels and Matthias and others had, had put together was that this was really a rather extremely comprehensive resource and with the sort of pre um, divisions along the different stages lent itself to further sort of um, specification with this concept of entry points and so this idea emerged out of really once we were through the design sprint grappling with the question of how would a researcher approaching this thinking tool actually know where to start um, and what would be useful sort of um, toe holds, places to land, sort of prompts to help orient uh, to the vast wealth of questions to promote reflection and improvement of project um, project design. And so uh, the, the way we approached this was modeled off of some work that I had done with colleagues um, in, a, in a rather different context uh, to try to um, map um, questions associated with uh, the institutional analysis and design framework developed by Eleanor Ostrom to um, a robustness and resilience framework developed by Marty Andrews. Um, and this involved taking sort of different guiding questions and research prompts from one framework to the other. And the way we did that was a collaborative consensus based um, sort of clustering exercise. And so I thought here we have um, an exceptional foundation of, of questions. Um, Designed to design to to these sort of stages. How do we take them to a sort of a mysterious, accessible entry point, and then map the questions from one to the other? And so the first part of the process was for each stage gate, um, collaboratively set out a sort of high-level sense of what are some major sort of questions one might ask as part of each each stage. So in the design and problem formulation, um, am I thinking about responsibility as a general idea? How do I sort of start to think about that. How do I start to think about um, partners and disciplines and sectors that help me convene a project that can speak to responsibility? Um, how do I start to think about responsibility throughout the implementation plan that we're developing? Um, for example, in the data analysis stage, how are we addressing communication around uncertainties? Are we doing this responsibly and transparently? How are we thinking about involving stakeholders in the validity and reliability and relevance testing of the results? Um, and so these kinds of um, what we came to call entry points, which you can see soon after you arrive to the, the landing page for the tool, which will be shown later. Um, 
to really say, okay, maybe this is a place to start answering questions. And so once we collaboratively built out that sort of set of four um, entry points for each stage, um, we had a similar cluster consensus-based clustering exercise where four of us got together in Aarhus to lay out each of the questions. And it was, a, I, I thought it was quite enjoyable, sort of tactile process, especially um, nostalgically now, given where we are. But uh, we were cutting out uh, strips of, of the questions and made, made sure each question had its corresponding tag of stage, key and dimension of, of responsible research and innovation. Uh, and then we mapped the questions onto these different um, entry points. And each of those formed sort of a cluster that then became the sort of scaffold for the online deployment of the tool. And the way we went through the clustering was quite simply, if, if we all could quickly agree that a question aligned to an entry point, we mapped it. Um, and we put questions that were sort of harder to map to the side. Uh, and then we came back to those more difficult questions later on in the process and decided whether we needed to revise them to be more clear, uh, split them, uh, remove them all entirely. And that led, because of the way all of the questions were actually uh, coded um, uh, uh, on the strips of paper themselves, we could then enter the data back into an Excel sheet that helped with the architecture of the overall tool um, later on. And um, and now you can see when you open up the tool how each entry point brings you to a set of reflection questions and those reflection questions are tagged quite robustly with the different elements of, of responsible research and innovations and I'll, I'll pass it on to um, the next person in the team. Thanks uh, Michael uh, and in the meantime I see a question from uh, from Richard um, on uh, where where we can whether we can use this tool because this is through the through the the stages and the and the ideation phase of research project whether this this tool is also available or uh, applicable for for projects in 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 a territorial context where projects uh, uh, start uh, through negotiation and discussion. And, and and whether it could be applied there. Um, I think um, that this question, uh, Richard, will be answered in part by, by, by our validation steps and phases, but ideally I would say yes, because the questions in the tool are, are so general that they are, and that they can be understood by any type of partner, what, no matter what, 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 what context they are, it is just a matter of arriving at the right question in the right time. But I think this is something to, to also to, to, to uh, tap upon in the, in, the, in the validation phase. So, uh, Tung Tung, I think it's, 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 the honor is up to you to, to talk us through the, the, the resulting thinking tool because bring, getting together all the, all the things um, uh, the questions and the prompts and the wireframe led to a tool that was developed in Arif, by the way, and it carries your voice. So, um, yes, <laughs> uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Show it. <laughs> Great. So, while uh, Michael and Arhu's team were busy tagging um, the questions and entry points together, uh, so the designer already made uh, a homepage according to you know our needs and and our sketches. Um, so initially here, I will show you, uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, we plan on, you know, putting the gates around the tool and then um, people can fill in their project name and email, they click start, they enter the tool. Uh, and um, let me zoom in here. Um, back then the idea was to just have this really fancy prototype where you can really see on the left here there is a I want to show this because it's important you know expectations and reality um, and also what what evolved um, from our wire per frame prototype uh, so people can click the conditions whether they want to anticipate include uh, or respond and then you have the RI keys drop down uh, whether it's about public engagement 
uh, open access and so on. And here people can choose whether they're a researcher, policymaker, funder, and here uh, these are where they can click their entry points and we can see all these colors being tagged to it. So it has, this design has a much more uh, dynamic uh, purposes. And then the actual tool, let's see. So this is the homepage, which is done by um, uh, computer science students at our host university. And I think they've done a great job uh, looking at the prototype. So if you wanna hear my voice again, you can go click play. Uh, this is the YouTube instruction. Uh, so in our home page, we try to explain the tool, what it is, um, and also what is RRI. Uh, and then we try to specify a description of these conditions so people know what to expect and the keys. Um, and when they're ready, uh, they can click uh, try the tool. So as you can see, it's very, very similar to our wireframe. And create new project, just type test. Um, here immediately you're presented with the gates. Um, and here you can see what, uh, reiterating what Matthias was saying, you know, you have gate one, which is ideation stage, gate two, uh, data collection or implementation stage, gate three, uh, data analysis, and gate four, uh, dissemination. So that really depends on, as a researcher, uh, for you to select yourself where you are. So if you go to gate one, uh, you pick an entry point, uh, as developed by uh, Michael and our host team. So why are you here in this tool in the first place? So going back here, uh, we've, I think um, Stefan will then address what people think about these selections. So whether you wanna focus on why you're here or certain keys uh, or certain conditions. But here we have, say I wanna develop a responsible project implementation plan. Um, then I would be able to see the entry points here and I could choose and change my entry point. I could also select the keys and conditions here. Um, and all the questions you will see, just like in the idea we had in the wireframe. So as you fill in the question, so for this question, what actions will we take to involve? Um, you know, you can also say, I don't know, I need to discuss with my team. So if you also don't know, you can also click methods um, and then you can see that we've suggested the methods and we tag it to the question. Um, you click next. So you would see that once I answer a question, it becomes green. So it goes full circle um, if you answer all the question um, and so on. And you can also add your own question that are relevant to you. Um, why are we doing this? And save um, and then you can generate PDF uh, once you're done so the idea is that once you have this project uh, you've typed it in your answers and you consider hey did I include people how are we doing in public engagement um, you generate this document and the idea is that you bring it back to your team or your project partners and your project members to discuss this further so that's a very brief um, introduction of the tool. Thanks, Tung Tung. I think it's uh, it's again showing all the all the all the hard work that, and all the considerations that have been going into it. Maybe just wait a bit with this slide, uh, uh, Helmut. Go back one, please. And the reason is that in the meantime, now that we had this one done, uh, and this was I think whole way through uh, through the New Horizon project. Uh, the first, of course, place where we could test and show our work were the social labs of New Horizon. So, actually, Andre visited a number of these um, social lab meetings and showed our work uh, and, and did that enthusiastically and, and also got back the feedback from them. So, maybe Andre. Uh, please elaborate a bit on, on what you've heard back from, from the social labs as they are, of course, within the RRI bubble, at least to some extent, but also have a working place where they could apply this tool. So um, what, were the, what were the general uh, comments that you received? Thanks, Ingeborg. 
uh, it was really a very interesting experience to be able to present and discuss the two within different social labs with people from different backgrounds, different uh, working uh, areas and, and project purposes. So it was quite a, a rich discussion. And I, I, I think we could group the reactions into three main Area. So the first one relates closely to uh, what Niels mentioned, the idea of where is the score? Where is the, the, the level that we would like to have? Of course, this is a minority. It was a small group, but a consistent group that said, oh, we are a little frustrated because we wanted to, to get a sort of grade on our societal efforts. and and. It was surprising uh, on the one hand, because actually, uh, if you're talking about RRI, we're talking about scaping metrics, scaping numbers, scaping, scaping grades. And, and there was kind of a, a feeling from some of the participants that it would be nice to have kind of a, a quality stamp that you could have. So you go through the two, at the end you have a good score. If the score is good, you stamp on your project. If it's not good, you pretend you never went through the two, but uh, of course, everyone understood the idea that it was not a responsible approach to, to, to try to find a grade or a score or a level or some number as a result from the effort, uh, even from uh, the technological uh, approach to it, because uh, two possibilities would exist. One would be to automate an evaluation. So we would have to use some uh, neural uh, network processing and, and machine learning to try to analyze the text and, and to have a score. And we all know how imperfect those methods still are. The other possibility was to include, for example, a uh, self-evaluation scale for each one of the questions where people would self-evaluate their own results. And by the end, we would somehow calculate a result from that. And of course, we know that different perspectives, different countries, different realities uh, would lead to completely inconsistent uh, evaluations. And a good example for that is the gender issue that we know that across different countries, uh, if you ask how well are you doing in terms of gender and reducing the gender gap in science, uh, the perspectives to answer the question are completely different because it comes from different realities. So it was not really a possibility. Of course, uh, everyone understood that perspective and, and validated even more the choice that was made. Uh, the second group, and I think that this was the, the, the absolute majority of the participants, uh, was uh, of an inspirational perspective. So everyone thought that the two was very inspirational in the sense of how can I think about things that sometimes uh, are hard to get there. So one of the, the, the recurrent uh, topics was that people mentioned how great it would be to count with some tool like that, especially uh, in early career research, because you're struggling about finding responsibility, finding a, a societal approach to what you do. And uh, with time, uh, you tend to incorporate these thoughts into your own perspectives. But the fact is that when you're beginning, uh, it's not necessarily obvious. So it was a good tool to help you remember important things and help you guide your, your thought process into incorporated, incorporating a more uh, responsible approach to your own research. So this was uh, an important uh, uh, group. And the third group was a group of the what now? What comes next? Uh, what, can, uh, what can the two offer? in the future. And this is an interesting thing because uh, some discussions came 
in the sense of how can I apply this to, to my reality? So another recurrent suggestion, for example, was that we included the possibility for collaboration uh, so that multiple team members could work on the same project from different perspectives and, and, and try to do something that we have been doing now for a year, that's uh, remote collaboration. It was uh, kind of a, a prediction of the reality that would face because the last meeting we had to discuss that was actually in Berlin three weeks before the lockdown started. Uh, so that was a little of the perspective. How can we have uh, several minds uh, reflecting on the same topics and logging into the same account and trying to uh, collaborate with that. So it was one of the uh, suggestions for the future in terms of how can we incorporate this into our uh, uh, processes. So it was an interesting debate. I think that uh, the acceptance of the tool as a guide uh, for the thought process around responsible research was very well received. I think that summarizes it. Thanks, André. And just to be, uh, for, for the record, I think you visited the Social Lab of Health, the uh, Social Lab of SWAF, SWAFs, and, and which was the third one? Um, no, uh, I was at this too. Okay, okay. And we also, and Tung Tung also presented it, I think, at the widening participation. Yes. Uh, so Social Lab, yeah. Yeah, 14. Yeah. Um, and then, um, uh, of course, this was all very nice. And then we said, okay, but now we have to go out and, 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 and put the thing to practice and also validate our thinking. And that is the work that, uh, that uh, Stefan and I did. So, Stefan, if you could pick up on this and, and, and explain what we uh, did and, and why we did it and how we did it. Uh, that would be very useful. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ingeborg. Um, it's my pleasure to talk about that. And, and mind you, I wasn't involved in any of the previous phases, so it felt a bit like running off with someone else's baby and asking the world, what do you think of this baby? Um, so that felt like a huge responsibility, but I think it was also an advantage because uh, it wasn't my baby. Um, so what did we do? Um, we organized six focus groups with experts and advisors within universities. So people who advise academics on grants, uh, but also on uh, issues related to ethics, gender, uh, public engagement. And um, we invited these people to participate in the focus groups because on the one hand, they are experts in a lot of the dimensions of RRI. So we expected them to, uh, well, to be able to help us to see whether these, these questions actually could help researchers. Uh, and also, they know the researchers because they interact with them on a daily basis about these, these topics. Um, so we organized these focus groups at six universities in the Netherlands, two comprehensive universities, two university medical centers, and two specialized universities. So one technical university and one university that specializes in the social sciences and humanities, um, basically to cover um, the dimension, or sorry, the domains of science to uh, to make sure that our findings are uh, generalizable to a certain extent. And within these focus groups, we uh, made use of uh, semi-structured uh, protocols, and we asked participants to first explore the tool, and then we asked them, okay, so what do you think about this? We had a discussion about that. And then we asked them um, to dive deeper into the tool uh, for one of the dimensions of RRI, to explore that into further detail. And again, we had a discussion. And apart from these six focus groups, we also had six interviews with um, five researchers from different scientific disciplines and one project uh, officer um, who closely collaborated with a PI uh, in, uh, in monitoring and, uh, and, and, and managing projects. Um, in these interviews, again, we asked them to use the tool, but these were thinking aloud interviews. So we asked them with every step, with every move to verbalize what they were thinking. Things like, what is this button? Uh, hmm, hmm, I don't know what this question actually means, or I don't know what I should do here. So that's what we did in those focus groups and interviews. Um, but I think the most interesting thing is then what came out of that? What did people say? And the first thing they said was uh, they liked the overall look. As someone said, definitely not a Windows 95 view. And I don't know how many people 
uh, over here still remember the Windows 95 feel. I do. Um, and indeed, we are 25 years apart from, uh, from that moment. So that, I think, was a good comp great compliment. But the best one was that the questions are valuable. Um, they stimulate reflection. Um, just to give an example, there was a researcher in, in the health domain who is working on e-health in Africa. And um, one of the gender questions made her realize that um, because they were installing these tools on phones, because men in remote villages in Africa are usually the ones who have access to the phones, actually the research was gendered because women potentially wouldn't um, uh, benefit as much from their research as men. So these questions really help the researcher to reflect on those uh, things. And uh, the advisors, they actually mentioned the same thing. They said these questions are much broader than um, we usually think of. So it will also help them to advise the researchers. Um, and altogether, uh, we can conclude that the translation of these abstract policy and scholarly terms into understandable and meaningful questions uh, was successful. In fact, um, I think that people who use the tool don't even need to know about RRI to still be able to reflect on these, uh, these issues. So that's a great thing. Um, then you might ask, so are they resting on, on their laurels now? Uh, well, definitely not, because there were also some remarks that we should uh, really take on board. For example, as people say, uh, said, um, not all research and innovation practices are the same. So for some people, the routing through the tool wasn't as obvious as we hoped uh, for. Um, for example, they would say, OK, so where should I start? Um, and, um, and, and should I answer every question? Some, answer, uh, some questions perhaps don't apply to my research. And also some terms cause confusion, especially to term gate. People said, well, uh, we think in terms of research phases, what's a gate? So that's something to think about. And some functionalities are uh, not as obvious to spot as, as we thought. For example, the methods button. Often we had to tell people like, hey, there's a methods button. And if you click on that, you get more resources. Um, so, all in all, the presentation of these valuable, meaningful questions requires some improvement. And then, to, uh, to conclude, what would participants then actually use the tool for? Andre already touched on this, so people said, yeah, collaborative purposes, that would be great if the tool would enable that. Um, but people also said we can use it to train junior researchers, uh, even students. Um, uh, but also uh, senior researchers said, I could ask my junior researchers to first work on these issues themselves, and then we can discuss it later on. And that's also something that the advisors mentioned. I can give a link to my researchers, and then afterwards I can help them to further improve their, uh, their answers. Uh, people also said we can use it to monitor the project. So we won't only use it during developing the proposals, but also when monitoring the project. And um, um, one final recommendation that I thought was really interesting because it showed that people don't only want to use this in within the context of funding is that they said this would also be great to use during departmental meetings. For example, if we have a meeting about gender or ethics, we can use the tool and then jointly answer these questions. It would really facilitate uh, a discussion on these, uh, these issues. So all in all, uh, the questions are valuable. The presentation could be tweaked a little bit. Um, but also from the perspective of the users, the, the potential is very real uh, of this tool. Thanks, Stefan. It was uh, it was a pleasure going uh, going around these universities, uh, the two of us, and 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 hear all these uh, feedback from the people. And I think it's also interesting to say that we didn't explain the tool, so we started them. We started asking them. Uh, so, what is your expectation of a tool like this first? without having seen anything and without explaining anything on RRI and then letting them start with the tool with the introduction either the the, the voice or the or the reading and then going further and and that, that was that was very 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 useful to to experience and indeed there are some uh tweaks to be to be made and and maybe also some improvements which uh, i think um uh, links directly to the question that I saw in the chat uh, from uh, Gita Kraak from Aarhus University, whether it's open source, this tool, and whether you can 
um, get the code and, and adjust it for your own purposes. And I think I have to uh, ask Niels this because I, I'm, I'm, to be frank, I don't know the answer here. Uh, thanks a lot, Ingeborg, and uh, thanks, Gide. That's a, a wonderful uh, question. I think that what I should probably say first also as a bit of a roundup is that uh, it turns out that they're actually user, <laughs> users of the tool, which is good, uh, good news considering the efforts that, uh, that the, the team and, and my colleagues here ha have actually gone through in order to provide something that we consider uh, rather robust and, uh, and uh, user-friendly. So we have something in the area of uh, 400 or even more projects registered now as uh, users. A substantial part of those are just testing it out, just exploring, just entering to see what uh, the tool is all about. But uh, a rough estimate is that uh, uh, 100 plus actual projects are, are, are using the tool uh, in order to stimulate the kind of collective discussions and uh, reflections and uh, debates that help them take into account the broader societal context throughout the project uh, uh, duration. So we are very happy about that. And we obviously thinking about in the context of uh, uh, super, uh, of uh, the, the New Horizon project and the other projects, are there tweaks and elements that we could uh, that we could employ or apply also based on the, the responses uh, um, that were that we learned about uh, earlier through the focus groups from the social lab uh, participants, uh, etc. And there are some obvious opportunities. And exactly what you what you're asking, uh, Gide, whether uh, sub substantively this could be tailored to some of the emerging issues such as citizen science do we capture the elements of open science that we would like to uh, to uh, to explore etc could it be tailored to different kinds of uh, users and these are um, all areas of uh, development that we'd be more than happy to uh, to discuss and uh, and uh, consider as it stands the code is not open source uh, when New Horizon comes to an end, the project as a whole needs to decide what is going to happen with the code. Uh, it's now located at Aarhus University. I can see from your mail uh, from, that you are from Aarhus University, <laughs> so it makes it easier, at least, easier, at least for the two of us, to have a discussion uh, about how, how we might be able to help you in your context. Uh, but the project, the New Horizon project, needs to decide what is going to be the long-term trajectory when it comes to uh, to uh, further development and uh, of uh, the tool. It will be maintained. It's at a safe site at uh, Aarhus uh, uh, University and there will be uh, sustained access by uh, 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 users. So it's not going to evaporate once the, the, the project uh, comes to an end, but the potential for improvement is still up for, uh, um, is still up for discussion. One of the things that we put a lot of uh, energy into discussing at the early, early stages of our development plan was whether we would want a, uh, a more privileged access as researchers to the contents that users are actually embedding within uh, the system. Because there's no doubt that there is uh, a wealth of information on how projects actually think through different stages of their uh, work about uh, their interaction with societal stakeholders and the uh, medium and long-term impacts of the work that uh, they do. And we think that for research purposes, it could be extremely interesting to start looking more systematically at the contents which is now being provided by users. But we didn't ask consent to use the, the data and information by the uh, users uh, so far. So this means that we are not exploring or harvesting any of uh, the data, not even for research purposes. In the longer term, one could easily imagine that a precondition for using the tool would be to allow for research purposes the data to be used. But this is also something that we need to discuss in the, in the, project, um, in the project context once uh, we come towards uh, uh, the end of it. Uh, that was a bit long, Ingeborg, sorry. 
no problem. I think it, it fits perfectly with the things that we have written down uh, in, in the policy brief on uh, the validation of the thinking tool. And then you can, you can find that on the, on the New Horizon website. Maybe uh, it can be put in the chat as well. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's actually um, policy brief number four uh, for those of you who want to know a bit more about the validation. But there is, and that was also one of the questions in the chat. Um, uh, the, the 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 somebody who is uh, is going through a design process herself and uh, was wondering to get access to the feedback from stakeholders. And of course, it we have collected all the feedback and it has been analyzed with Atlas TI. So there is a big, uh, um, a lot more information and background information available. So if you contact me or Stefan de Jong, we can, uh, we can, we can discuss that. And I think, um, uh, because it, it, as you say, uh, we should build upon our knowledge and, and not repeat the things that are already being done. Um, I think in the policy brief, we have three main uh, recommendations. One for researchers to really, um, to make it maybe a bit more compulsory or mandatory to, to think about these things uh, and, and, and not uh, just mentioning it in a call as an opportunity, but the, as a requirement, how that should be organized, I'm not sure yet. We are discussing the to tool with uh, funders. Uh, and see uh, whether they can can take it up in their funding requirements or in the calls and the text to go through it. And this has been part of the of the validation discussions as well, where people said, "Okay, I'm 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 willing to spend some time on this, but then it would be nice if we answer a question collaboratively or whatever. If that part can then directly go into um, a, a, a research proposal or things like that." Um, and that is, uh, that is, so I'm, I'm discussing these things with uh, the Dutch uh, uh, funders and um, we know actually that the European Commission is interested in the thinking tool and would like to maintain the lifespan of it through maybe other uh, RRI projects um, uh, beyond the New Horizon lifetime. Um, and we're also discussing this uh, with policymakers and advisors, for instance, through these territorial or uh, smart specialization uh, led uh, groups to co create the further development of the thinking tool and make it adapted in that sense to, to include many entry points that are more appropriate for uh, regional development or more innovation related um, uh, worrying. Uh, so in that sense, the further development is, is completely open for all of us to, 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 to take the ne next steps there. Um, and with that, I would like to stop the conversation from us and go to the questions that you may have. Uh, Shona, please help me. Is there more that, uh, that we haven't addressed yet? So that's the policy brief. Are there any other questions that you would like to ask us right now? So we are very open. Well, there's, a, there's another question in the discussion, in the chat. Yeah. Um, there's Mia asking whether the, um, there is a way to get access to the feedback from stakeholders and user tests. Yes, that's, yeah, I addressed that because there is that information and it is uh, actually uh, uh analyzed through atlas ti so uh, there's a, a lot more information available but she has to contact us please mm -hmm. um any other question i think we are reaching uh, 11 o'clock i have one more slide i forgot what's on that yes the next steps of course and that is something that is for us also maybe a question with a question mark for the development. We would like to do that in whatever uh, construction. We would like to spread the word. So it's also, uh, we hope that you will be the ambassadors of, uh, of, um, uh, uh, of this tool 
uh, to, to stimulate the uptake uh, and also the sustainability as, as I discussed and I think it would be um, um, ah, other language versions that's a good question Richard as part of the mainstream yes that would definitely be one of the one of the ways and I think uh, Andre already discussed the tool in the Brazilian context so uh, there's definitely an interest in in, in other languages and 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 um, uh, making it more appropriate to to other cultural contexts, broadening out the gender to to diversity and things like that. Um, and I think that one of the um, sustainability parts could be to show you where this um, tool is because it has a place in the RRI exhibition. That is the. the is um, um, developed as a as a kind of a, a museum of uh, of new horizon, and um, I think Marie and uh, and Helmut can show you where the tool is in the RRI exhibition, and I think if there are no other questions, we would like to close the session with showing where the where the where the tool is in the RRI exhibition which is one way to make it a bit sustainable, but we all would like to work on longer term sustainability. So thank you very much for all your, for your attention and questions.